Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Professor Barlow Dermagradichin of the Armenian Studies Program. I would like to welcome you to this second presentation in the Armenian Studies Program Fall Lecture Series. And tonight's lecture is co-sponsored by the Armenian Studies Program and supported by the Leon S. Peters Foundation, which supports all of our uh, lecture series. And we thank them very much for that. All of our events this semester will be a Zoom uh, webinars. And after the presentation tonight, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our speaker. And I'd like to ask you to use the question and answer function of the Zoom meeting to ask your questions. And we'll try to answer as many questions as we can uh, this evening. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our upcoming events. And I'm gonna share a screen that will give a brief uh, presentation about our upcoming events, because in the next few weeks, we have uh, three or four very interesting events. So I'd like to share that with you at this time. Thank you. Uh, we do have some really exciting events coming up. So uh, if you're interested in finding out more, you can always make sure to email me and I'll put you on our email blast that gives information about upcoming events. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our Kazan visiting professor in Armenian studies for the fall semester, Dr. Ohanes Kilic. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about him first. Uh, he double majored in sociology and political science uh, from the department uh, from the Boaz Ichi Uni University in Istanbul. He completed his doctorate in 2014, and his dissertation was called The Socio Political Reflections and Expectations of Ottoman Armenians after the 19 revolu 1908 Revolution Between Hope and Despair. Uh, between 2003 and 2017, he lectured at Istanbul Bilgi University in the sociology department and was teaching about late Ottoman Empire and modern Turkey. He was also a research fellow at the Near Eastern Studies of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor in 2012 and 13. And from 2017 to 19, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard University. And finally, in spring 2020, he was appointed as the Nikki and Eleanor Orchanian Visiting Professor of Middle Eastern uh, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University. His specialties uh, of interest are the history of non-Muslims in the Ottoman Empire in Turkey and the relationship between them in this multi-ethno-religious uh, society. And there's much more to be said about him. Uh, Dr. Kilic Dai is teaching a course while he is here at uh, Fresno State, and he is also going to be giving uh, two more lectures 
uh, in the rest of our semester. So we'll be talking about those again at the end of uh, this, this, this presentation. Tonight, he is going to be giving a talk on living together requires dying together, conscription of Armenians into the Ottoman army after the 1908 revolution. And so he'll be talking about this very uh, important moment in uh, the history of the Ottoman Empire uh, in which for the first time officially, uh, Armenians and other minorities were gonna be allowed to um, be conscripted into the army. And what was a discussion among the Armenians themselves and among mm -hmm. other groups? So it's my great pleasure today to introduce again and present Dr. Ohanes Kilichta. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dermigurdichian, for uh, for kind introduction and as well as for having me as well, Kazan uh, Professor. Uh, I hope we met under normal circumstances, but anyway, this is a global situation beyond every one of us. But let's say thanks that we have at least this opportunity uh, through technology to meet uh, and have this conversation. Uh, let me try to share my screen first. Uh, I think you are able to see. Yeah. Uh, today, uh, as you know, I'm gonna talk about the conscription of Armenians into the Ottoman army after the 1908 uh, uh, revolution. Uh, let me uh, begin with the question of why it is important to look at military service. Uh, what does it tell us uh, when we examine uh, uh, the military service in, in Ottoman Empire? Indeed, the answer of this question is a general one, meaning uh, I, I'm trying to say that it's not peculiar to Ottoman Empire. Uh, it's important because I think the composition of an army of a certain uh, country tells much about the identity, political identity and characteristics of, of that particular state. In other words, who is eligible to be drafted and who is not uh, is an important indicator about the political regime uh, and social uh, order of that particular state and, and country. In other words, when you examine the scope of conscription in a country, it means you examine indeed the way of governing, the way of ruling uh, in that particular country. Uh, I mean, this is true for let's say 18th century as well as for today. I mean, uh, although it's not our topic, but look at who is serving in the US army at today, at present day. I think when you look at the composition of, of the army, uh, it will tell something about the characteristics of United States, for example. Uh, of course, uh, as I say, this is true, uh, not only for Ottoman Empire or for uh, uh, any country, but the general, uh, uh, I think, uh, situation. Uh, and of course, if we go one step further, we can also add that who are commanding officers in an army and who are just private servicemen. Uh, 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 this factor or this situation or this composition also is, uh, is also uh, telling, revealing about that uh, country and state. Uh, although I will not be able to elaborate on all of these uh, uh, under, because of time restriction, sure. Uh, that just I want to mention this in the beginning of my talk, why it is important, as I say, to examine or to study military service or the composition of an army in a certain country. So uh, today, uh, or tonight, let's say, uh, we will talk about the situation or the events after the 1908 revolution, but indeed the conscription of Christians and Jews in the Ottoman Empire was not discussed for the first time in 1908. Uh, but on the contrary, it was an old issue, old debate, uh, roughly speaking from the late 1830s on, the conscription of Christians uh, because of different reasons, not 
Jews in 19th century, but the conscription of uh, Christians was one of the frequent debates in Ottoman bureaucracy. Uh, uh, more specifically speaking, uh, Ottoman bureaucracy from 1830s on, let's say, through, uh, through until 1908, Ottoman bureaucracy was divided, divided into two, uh, let's say, opposite camps in this issue. One camp or one uh, fraction was supporting the conscription of Christians and the other camp uh, was opposing this project, let's say. Uh, I mean, every camp uh, had its own arguments and reasons to support and not to support the conscription of uh, Christians, but to cut the long story short, uh, at the end, let's say the dom uh, conservative uh, fraction or conser conservative part of the Ottoman bureaucracy dominated in 19th century and uh, conscriptions, the conscription of Christians was not carried out, was not realized uh, in 19th century. Only in 1856, uh, the, let's say, traditional Islamic tax collected from Christian and Jewish males, uh, namely jizye, uh, was turned into a military exemption tax. Uh, what does this mean? I mean, uh, it has many reflections, it has many reasons, uh, as well as domestic and as it related to also uh, Ottoman relations with Europe, etc. But uh, again, very briefly, it means that, I mean, this uh, transformation of GZA to military exemption tax, meaning that on the paper, Christians and Jews became liable for military service. Also, this means that their equality, their po political equality with Muslims was also recognized, but just on the paper, theoretically speaking. But in practice, uh, almost nothing had changed. They continued to pay a special tax, but not under the name of Jizya, but this time, uh, they paid it as a military exemption tax. Uh, and this uh, situation, but in an important detail, let me not to forget it, uh, this tax, this military exemption tax uh, had been paid not only by those, by those males at the age of active duty, but by all males until up to 70 years old. In other words, uh, all males, I mean Christian and Jewish uh, males, were responsible to pay this military exemption tax, whether or not they were at the age of uh, military active duty. So what happened in 1908 that this situation changed? Of course, it's a long story again, but let me try to paraphrase it in a few sentences. In 19, uh, more specifically, in July 1908, after a series of events which are out of the scope of this talk, Abdulhamid II had to restore, re-announce the constitution and parliament after three decades of despotic rule. Uh, the first Ottoman experience of constitutional monarchy was a short one between uh, let's say from the last month of 1876 to, uh, to the mid 1878, uh, uh, when uh, Abdulhamid II suspended constitution and, and parliament uh, on the pretext of the war with Russia uh, of the time. Uh, and, you know, as I say, following three decades, he gradually established his own despotic and totalitarian uh, rule. As I say, in July 1908, uh, again, but, uh, he had to restore this constitutional regime. Uh, and you know, it was a time of high expectations uh, about a more democratic, more egalitarian feature of the country. Uh, and it was a heyday of Ottomanism, uh, which, at least again, ideally speaking, or on theoretically speaking, which accepted 
everyone as equal citizens regardless of religious identity. And one of the important requirements or necessities of this political equality is to be conscripted. In other words, extension of military service to all, not only Muslims, but to all, uh, is a necessity and indicator of equality. Okay, so, uh, and you know, we can tell much about 1908, about the political atmosphere, uh, and you know, everybody uh, was very optimistic uh, about the future, uh, and you know, these famous principles of French Revolution, namely equality, liberty, uh, and fraternity, uh, and plus justice as an Ottoman addition, uh, were very popular uh, after the 1908 revolution. So uh, at least for a couple of years, let's say. So we will discuss uh, the conscription of Armenians and their reaction to this conscription in this context, in this political context, when and where this constitution and parliament was restored uh, and uh, bring about an uh, optimism about uh, uh, about the democracy of of Ottoman land, uh, but before going into details details uh, of my content, uh, yeah, uh, let me just quickly show my sources. Uh, in other words, how do I? conclude or uh, what I say, how did, did I reach the conclusions, what, what kind of material uh, I used. Uh, one of the important or the main material, I used the Armenian press of the time. In other words, Armenian newspapers and periodicals published after 1908. And uh, not only, but especially I used periodicals Armenian periodicals or newspapers published in different locations of uh, provinces in, in uh, West and East, uh, I mean Anatolia uh, or six provinces, six Armenian provinces. Uh, as I said, let me quickly show some examples. For example, this is Haraj from Erzurum, uh, which can be described as semi-official organ of uh, local Tashnak uh, Armenian Revolutionary Federation uh, par uh, party, let's say. Uh, this is Haraj, as I say. This is Yeprat from Harpert, Harput. Uh, again, officially, it was an organ of the American college, Yeprat College. Uh, I also used this journal. Uh, this is Putanya from Adapazaru region. Uh, that I use. This is Antranik uh, from Sivas. Uh, this is Izmirli, as you may guess, from Izmir or Zumirni. Uh, and in addition to these journals, uh, the Armenian press, I also used uh, archival documents from uh, Ottoman archive. Uh, for example, what you see on the screen uh, is a petition uh, written by the Armenian Patriarchate about the conscription of Armenians uh, and given to the Ministry of Justice and Denominations. I also used this kind of uh, materials uh, to, to reach my conclusions, let's say, or to make my analysis. And lastly, uh, I don't have a picture sh to show about it, but I also used the minutes of Ottoman parliament and related minutes uh, of uh, about uh, conscription debate. Okay, now let me turn to the content, if you like, uh, of my talk. Uh, in the political atmosphere that I try to describe, describe also, uh, as I say, the conscription of Christians and Jews, again, became one of the hot debates of the time, okay? Uh, and uh, as I say, it is because uh, in this environment, extension of military service to all was a necessity of uh, equality, which was 
one of the popular principles of the time. And in this atmosphere, indeed, Armenians, both masses and political leadership, emerged as one of the staunchest, one of the strongest supporters of extension of military service to Armenians along other non-Muslims. And mainly they presented two reasons for this. The first one is ideological. The second one is more economic, let's say. Uh, I think I already mentioned the ideological one. They contended that uh, their exclusion from military service would mean the persistence of their secondary status or second class citizenship for themselves. Uh, so, and they added that in a constitutional regime, this was unacceptable. So, uh, abolishing military exemption tax and uh, 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 exemption tax and extension of military service for all, then uh, is a principle, is a political necessity, uh, according to them. Secondly, they also said that this tax, this military exemption tax, became a real huge financial burden on the shoulders of Armenian people, Armenian peasants, etc., which they were not able to carry anymore. Okay, so uh, they say that this was also an economic necessity or financial necessity for Armenians uh, to, if you like, get rid of this exemption tax. Uh, and indeed, we observe through uh, this press, etc., that there was also popular uh, pressure coming from bottom up uh, from Armenian people uh, for the abolition, uh, for the abrogation of this tax. For example, Armenian people in from the provinces sent telegrams to the Armenian Patriarchate, Ottoman Parliament, and newspapers in Istanbul demanding immediate abolishment of the tax and extension of military service to all, including themselves. Uh, for example, they also, besides sending telegrams, they also organized demonstrations, public demonstrations or rallies in different cities of uh, Anatolia in the spring and summer of 1909. For instance, uh, thousands of Armenians gathered in Harpert uh, on April 1, 1909, uh, and demanded their conscription. Similarly, on March 31, 1909, uh, according to newspaper Antranik uh, from Sivas, almost 4,000 Armenians rallied in the city in Sivas for the abolishment of the tax and extension of conscription. And at the end of this rally, uh, we learned that they uh, penned a telegram and sent it to the Armenian Patriarchate, to the Ottoman Parliament, and to the newspapers in, in uh, the capital city. And this is the uh, text, if you like, uh, of that, uh, let's say, telegram. Maybe I should quickly read it. Uh, it says, quote, today almost 4,000 people organized a rally and demanded to be active soldiers by the extension of the duty of protecting fatherland as a necessity of the constitution to Armenians, just like Muslims. People who are completely powerless to pay the exemption tax and strongly rejecting this contradictory situation with equality, want the exact implementation of, const of the constitutional provision in the name of people, Matthias Kurtian, Avadis Aginian, Grastian, Vartanian, Moskofian, etc. So uh, I just present this as an example of uh, bottom-up pressure, okay, coming from Armenian people. We are talking about here, according to account, at least in the newspaper, we are talking about here thousands of people thousands of Armenians demanding this, okay? Uh, I can uh, mention other examples related to this uh, popular, if you like, uh, uh, willing, popular uh, uh, desire. For example, uh, on June 23, 1909, 130 Armenian shopkeepers in Sirt, Sirt, 
did not open their shops to protest the persistence of the tax and demanded the conscription of Armenians. Uh, not only in provinces, uh, one can come across also some meetings, rallies, uh, debates uh, in the capital city, in Istanbul also, organized by Armenians, I mean, uh, to demand uh, uh, the, abolishment, the abolishment of uh, a tax and the extension of uh, conscription. Uh, shortly, there was a strong push, as I say, a popular push from bottom up uh, to abolish the tax. Just as a note, let me say that Tashnak Sukyun, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, played a prominent role in all these demonstrations, meetings, etc. But uh, it was not possible, it's not possible to say that uh, this demand was restricted or limited with the ARF. Uh, on the contrary, uh, this demand, I mean, uh, abolishment of the tax and the extension of military service to all, this demand found a very extensive, a very large support among Armenians, uh, be it in the political circles, be it in religious circles, uh, and be it uh, on at popular level, okay? So uh, this issue, this extension of military service uh, was also discussed, of course, in the parliament, in the Ottoman parliament, in long sessions from April to July, 1909. Uh, it seems that nobody, no deputies, no governmental officials, uh, uh, no member of ruling party, party of the time, Committee of Union and Progress, or Young Turks, no one uh, was openly uh, opposing this project, this, let's say, uh, extension of military service. But it seems some of deputies were dragging their feet, okay, at least to postpone this uh, project, uh, this extension. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the Ottoman government of the time had also its own worries about this project, let's say. Uh, uh, so the government and some deputies uh, defended that the tax should be collected at least for one more year uh, since its sudden abrogation once and for all would bring about a budget deficit a deficit in governmental budget. And moreover, they contended that it was not possible, practically not possible to carry, sorry, to carry out the conscription of Christians and Jews since necessary preparations, for example, pertaining to demography, pertaining to registers, had not been done. In other words, they say we couldn't realize this, we, we couldn't carry out this conscription in this year, in 1909, because we do not have necessary list of people, necessary list of uh, candidates, okay? So they uh, presented, they contended such kind of reasons and uh, at least, as I say, demanded the postponement uh, of conscription of Christians and Jews. Armenian deputies, in the parliament, in the Ottoman parliament, particularly Erzurum deputy Ohannes Vatkes and Istanbul deputy Kirkor Zohrab were strongly opposed, opposing this proposal in the parliament, I mean the postponement of the conscription. They contended that there was no other acceptable solution than immediate and total, total cancellation of the exemption for everyone, okay? Uh, they claimed that providing Ottoman unity was much more important than the budget deficit. They also said that paying fee, paying money, uh, instead of actual military service was dishonorable for Armenians and for other uh, non-Muslims. Uh, just as an example, uh, I present you a quotation from Kirko Zohrab, 
taken from the minutes uh, I mentioned. Uh, again, let me, if you like, uh, read it very quickly. He says, quote, we want to sacrifice our blood for our fatherland, meaning the Ottoman land. We try to make all laws here for the sake of fraternity. Only in this way our country can find peace. This feeling of fraternity could be established first and foremost through active military duty. This is thousand times more important than the budget. We are trying to eradicate all divisions from this country, prevent things such as tribalism, nationalism. We want to live together, meaning with Turks and Muslims, etc. So the iconic sentence here is, learning to live together, he says, requires dying together. So I think, I hope this gives you an idea about the attitude of these deputies uh, uh, in the parliament. Uh, again, to cut the long story short, uh, at the end of long sessions and hot debates, uh, eventually the parliament decided to terminate the exemption tax once and for all on July 12, 1909. And again, an, as an important point, not only rank and files of the army was open for Christians and Jews, but military as a profession was also became possible for these groups, Christians and Jews. Uh, although we do not know the exact numbers, we know that a group of Christians and Jews, uh, including of course Armenians, were accepted after this state into the military academy, graduated from military academy and served in the Ottoman army in the following years, even uh, in coming wars, in Balkan wars, uh, for example, in 1912 and 13. This decision of the parliament, meaning the abolishment of tax and extension of conscription, indeed uh, was met by joy and excitement uh, uh, from Armenian political parties, press and opinion leaders. Uh, so, as I say, they, different Armenian circles uh, greeted this decision with joy and excitement. For example, Armenian newspaper from Haraj in, in Erzurum described the conscription of Armenians, along other non-Muslims, as the solid base of constitutional regime and freedom. A correspondent writing from Bulanuk, a district of Erzurum, describes the psychology of local Armenians as such, quote, they breathe a sigh of relief after the exemption tax has been abolished and military service was expanded to all as the necessity of the principle of equality. Uh, I can quote um, I can make many quotations, I can give many examples from the press of the time, Armenian press of the time, but uh, let me only mention uh, this quotation uh, from Izmirli, newspaper Izmirli. Uh, I took this I, because I think it again represents the mentality of the time very well, at least uh, for, for a large part of Armenians uh, it is a representative quotation. Uh, again, it says, quote, we are not any longer reaya. A reaya is a word which uh, describes uh, Christians and Jewish subjects uh, of the empire. And of course, it's, it had a derogative, a negative uh, meaning. Uh, so it says, we are not any longer reaya. We are not any more gyavurs. I don't, I think I don't have to explain what Gavur means. Uh, we are not any more Gavurs or only taxpayers either. We are also children of this land. It is also our fatherland, since we are ready to sacrifice our blood to the last drop of, for the goodness of the country, unquote. So uh, uh, again, this is just an example 
one of the hundreds, if you like, hundred examples uh, of how Armenians met this decision and this conscription. And let me say that not only Armenian politicians or Armenian civil opinion leaders uh, or Armenian press, but also Armenian church and clergy welcomed the conscription of Armenians and moreover tried to encourage the youth, Armenian youth and their families for military service. Again, especially in the provinces, uh, Armenian clergy uh, or clerics were talking about the military service quite passionately, okay? For example, religious leader of Harpert region gave a lecture at the American college, Yeprat College of the town about military service and tried to prove through historical examples that Armenians were and still, still are abled, talented soldiers. And so he tries to prove that there was nothing to be afraid of for Armenians, okay, in military service. He encouraged the Armenian youngs to take this distinguished responsibility, quote unquote, heartily as Ottomans. So here, this cleric described, uh, uh, as many others described Armenians as uh, uh, Ottomans, okay? And military uh, service, he described as a necessity of being honored Ottomans, okay? Uh, there is relatively longer quotation. This is a, an, a, a part of declaration by the Armenian prelacy of Erzurum, published in Haraj. Uh, again, let me uh, quickly read it. Quote, as the spiritual father of the community, we, in a full conviction and conscious, invite our beloved flock to join military service wholeheartedly in order to protect the liberty that is won through so valuable sacrifices. All Armenian males at the age of conscription as the genuine children of the country without listening to any overt, overt and covert manipulation and complaining should happily sacrifice their life for the protection uh, of our dear fatherland and thus our community will become able and worthy of the benefits of equality everywhere and every time, uncle. So uh, I think, again, this is a, a, a concise example uh, reflecting the, the mentality, the approach of Armenian clergy uh, to the conscription. And let me uh, take your attention that this is an official declaration by prelacy of Erzurum. Uh, and I think it is difficult to imagine that uh, pre a prelacy uh, would make a declaration contrary to the Armenian Patriarchate. So uh, we can say that this is also the approach uh, of the Armenian Patriarchate. So overall speaking, uh, there was, generally speaking, a positive attitude, positive approach by Armenians to this conscription, uh, to extension of conscription and their military service. However, what I told until this moment was only one face of the coin, okay? As uh, some Armenians had also some fears and apprehensions about serving in the Ottoman army. There is a list, uh, uh, there's a short list of these apprehensions and problems. So in other words, everything was not so smooth and unproblematic. Uh, Armenian community, for example, had not had a collective memory, a collective experience transferred from previous generations, from older generations about serving in the army or about life in the barracks. So in other words, uh, their mind, their collective memory was just blank about military service, okay? They did not know what it meant 
to serve in an army and to live in barracks. Uh, and understandably, let's say, uh, they just uh, nurtured some fears about life in the army. And especially those at the age of active duty and their families were anxious about what would happen to them in the army, in the barracks. Uh, for example, how would their commanders and peers meet and treat them, okay? Uh, as I say, they had largely, before military service started, they had only negative images about military, about soldiers, about, let's say, Ottoman uh, state. So uh, being in the army then uh, triggered or this idea, of course, triggered a kind of uh, worry, uh, a certain kind of panic uh, at uh, uh, those, among those who were at the age of active duty. Uh, by the way, uh, let me mention, maybe I should have mentioned this before, but let me mention that military service uh, was designated for three years for those 21, 22, and 20 years old, okay? And an additional three years uh, were uh, designated for uh, reserve forces. So uh, meaning that uh, a male will be responsible for active duty for three years, okay? Uh, so then, these people and their families, these young ones and their families were especially worrying about uh, the implications of being in the army. Uh, for example, again, we read through the Armenian press, the pages of journals that they had the fear of being harassed and even beaten by their commanders or by their Muslim peers in the army. Uh, they were also worried about the physical conditions of the army life. For example, would there be enough and ed edible food? Would they get sick in the army? Uh, what about heating in the winter? So I'm trying to say that they had this kind of practical, if you like, uh, apprehensions uh, related to just uh, life and hygiene in the army. Another hesitation was about the economic uh, future of Armenian soldiers. As I say, active duty lasted for three years. It was not a short time. And most of them, most of these soldiers would leave their jobs and their businesses. So one of the worries is that would they be able to resume what they left three years before? So they ask this kind of questions uh, on, on, on articles and newspaper pieces uh, in the press, for example. Another major fear, as you may see on the list, uh, was forced or let's say semi-voluntary conversion to Islam. Uh, Christian soldiers may have been pushed or harassed to convert to Islam once they joined the barracks, they joined the ranks of the army. This is what some Armenians, especially clergy, Armenian clergy uh, was thinking. As I say, especially clergy and patriarchy were worrying about this issue of conversion or this risk of conversion. Uh, they proposed to employ permanent priests in the army as a measure, as a countermeasure, if you like, to prevent conversions uh, of these Armenian and other Christian soldiers. But the Ottoman state uh, simply rejected this proposal and uh, never employed uh, priests and or, or rabbis uh, in the Ottoman uh, uh, army. However, uh, from from the old times on, let's say from 19th century on, uh, there had been uh, Muslim clergy, imams in, in battalions in, in the army serving for the needs of uh, Muslim soldiers. 
So uh, as a matter of fact, empl employment of priests uh, was not only about to prevent conversions, but also it was about to meet the religious needs of Christian soldiers, okay? Uh, I mean, to follow their religious uh, obligations uh, when they were in the army. Uh, indeed, this issue, I mean, as you see on the list, religious needs and responsibility of non-Muslim soldiers, Christian and Jewish soldiers, uh, was another issue of bargaining between uh, patriarchates, let's say, and the state in terms of military service. Uh, but at the end, as I said, the state did not accept employing Christian and Jewish clergy in the army, but agreed to give partial and conditional leave of absence to Christian and Jewish soldiers for their weekly and annual religious holidays, okay? Uh, so in their eyes, let's say, uh, this is the maximum concession that they can uh, give to or give for the religious needs. Lastly, I should mention the technical but vital problems as again, as the last item on the list, such as the dates of birth, okay, of candidate soldiers. Uh, Ottoman birth certificates or uh, Ottoman ID certificates were not so dependable as the dates of birth might have been recorded wrongly, which means people might be drafted too young or too old. Again, this was an issue between the state and Armenian leadership, let's say. And at the end, the state, uh, more specifically speaking, the Ministry of War agreed uh, to use uh, church recordings, okay, as a reference point for this issue to solve this problem. Uh, as the patriarchate ensured that dates were recorded in church recordings, birth dates were uh, regarded, uh, registered very precisely. Okay, these were some fears, apprehensions, worries, etc. But overall, generally speaking, uh, despite these worries, these fears and problems, conscription of Christians and Jews indeed was carried out without a major problem. Uh, although again, we do not have exact official numbers, the data we collect from the press of the time might give an idea about the course of conscription or how well it went. Uh, Jamanat newspaper in Istanbul for example, published the li list of Armenian conscripts from November 1909 to January 1910. And according to these lists, uh, if we count all them, if you sum up all them, it, uh, it shows that more than 1,500 Armenians were conscripted just only from Istanbul between November 1909 to January 1910 uh, into both regular and reserve forces. Uh, or again, if you use other sources, other uh, newspapers, you can see that, for example, in June 1910, uh, more than uh, 1,100 or 1,100 Armenians were drafted from the province of, on the province of Sivas, I mean the whole province. Uh, so again, uh, despite all problems, one can say that it started to work properly uh, without any major interruption, uh, which cause, which may cause the total, uh, let's say, uh, abrogation of the project, but no, it, it, it went, well enough, if you like, uh, this conscription and 
tens, on, tens of thousands of Christians and Jewish uh, uh, males were conscripted. Now, let me finish my uh, talk with a question, which is, what can we learn from this experience? Or, of course, uh, many different conclusions uh, might be reached or many different interpretations uh, might be made. But what I want to underline at the end of my talk is that I think one of the obvious conclusions of this, let's say, uh, tale of this account is that Armenian political leadership, both civil and cleric, political leadership made their political investment in the Ottoman state after 1908. In other words, they envisioned a future, a future within the Ottoman political structure. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible to explain their attitude, their uh, fervent, staunch uh, willingness for, for the extension of conscription to military service. I think it shows us that they felt very affiliated with, with the Ottoman state before 1908, at least. Of course, it might change later. But as I say, these articulations about military service coming from them shows their uh, 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 projection uh, about the future, about the political future of Armenian people. Of course, it is a bitter irony of the history uh, that when Armenian deputies fervently defended the conscription of Armenians in the Ottoman parliament in 1909, they unwittingly took a step which facilitated the annihilation of Armenian people six years later. But of course, as I say, uh, this is just a bitter irony of the history. We cannot blame those deputies that they couldn't see this coming uh, just six years before. I think I should stop here. It's already 50 minutes. Uh, uh, I would be happy to answer as far as I can to answer your questions. And thank you for uh, your patience and, and uh, listening to me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Kivich uh, for the presentation. Um, I actually am going to start with a question, but I want to uh, ask those that are here in the, in the uh, meeting, if you have a question, use the question and answer uh, format. So there uh, should be a place that you can ask your questions, and then I will choose from questions to ask. And there are a couple coming up, but I, I had one for you. Uh, mm -hmm. when you were talking Please. about uh, the uh, the political elites and the church and even a popular movement that wanted to be uh, conscripted. But the dates were interesting because those were even in late 1909 after the events of Adana in April of 1909. And I was mm -hmm. wondering, did the Hunchucks ever speak up in their uh, press against it or what was their position towards uh, it? And then how did, the, how did those Armenians still continue to, to show faith in the government? Uh, you know, uh, although IRF uh, appeared as the fer most fervent or the most important supporter of this conscription issue, uh, I, at least personally, I did not come across any articulation by any uh, Armenian political leader opposing this idea or this project, including Hunchaks. For example, uh, I read some pieces written by Sabah Gulyan, uh, which was one of the important Hunchak leaders of the time. Uh, but uh, although he was not as, uh, let's say, uh, fervent as Tashnaks, uh, for example, he himself did not articulate any opposition uh, to this uh, project. And uh, I can say that it was a general attitude, general uh, uh, 
approach among Ar Armenians to welcome this uh, conscription issue. As for Adana, uh, you know, it's very interesting that, uh, as I say, that this uh, parliamentarian debate started in April 1909, which exactly uh, when Adana massacres happened. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, Adana massacres did not make Armenian deputies refrain or uh, retreat from their position. Uh, and you know what, oh, you know why? Because indeed conscription of Armenians into the army also uh, was regarded as a measure to, uh, to prevent such kind of events, such kind of massacres in the future. Because it means that there will be Armenian soldiers in the army, Armenian officers in the army. And if you consider even the role of Ottoman army in Adana massacres, it means that uh, Armenians would become a factor within the army to prevent such kind of events. So indeed, it makes sense that uh, Adana massacres did not uh, prevent these people from articulating conscription. On the contrary, it became another factor, if you like, supporting, feeling this demand of conscription. Okay, and now we have some uh, quite a few questions, so we'll try to go through as many as we can. Sure, sure. Uh, and again, for our, uh, our uh, people involved in the audience, this is being uh, recorded and will be put on the Armenian Studies Program YouTube channel. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can listen to it. So one question is uh, regarding the sources. Uh, the newspapers that you mentioned and others, are they, where are they accessible? Are they only in archives or are they accessible online? Uh, you know, when I collected them, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, they were not available online. I went to uh, Yerevan and uh, Vienna uh, to Mkhitaryist Monastery in uh, Vienna to, to collect them. Uh, so as far as I know, uh, but you know, not all of them, but afterwards, some of them became available online. Uh, third, uh, the website of third.am, something like that. I'm not sure about the exact web uh, address, uh, but still, uh, some of them are not available online, some of them are. You know, again, it's an, another irony maybe of the history is that you cannot find them in nowadays Turkey where they originally published, okay? So, uh, I mean, they were published in, as I say, Erzurum, Sivas, uh, I don't know, Adapazari, Izmir, etc. But it is not possible to find these journals nowadays in Erzurum, any in any in Sivas, in Izmir, etc. So, you have to travel other countries uh, to find them, or you can find those which are online available. Thank you. And uh, another sure. question, uh, were the Armenians and the, and the other non-Muslim conscripts uh, placed into separate units or regiments mm -hmm. or were they mixed in with Muslims? This is a good question. Indeed, this is one of the debates coming from or starting in 19th century. Uh, you know, again, it's a long uh, story, but uh, let me try to formulate a sh short and precise on answer. Uh, especially Greeks and Greek patriarchate uh, demanded separate battalions for, uh, for Christians. Uh, but I did not observe uh, this demand on the part of Armenians and Armenian patriarchate. Uh, uh, and the Ottoman state uh, was not willing uh, to separate, uh, to establish separate distinct battalions for Christians, but uh, it, uh, it supported to distribute uh, Armenians and other Christians and Jews into battalions uh, uh, separately, you know, uh, because they said that if they form uh, separate battalions for Christians, this might harm the unity of the army. Okay, uh, so what they prefer, 
uh, the short answer is that to distribute Armenians and other uh, non-Muslims uh, among the battalions, among the military units. So Ottoman state uh, had never liked, if you like, this idea of forming separate units. Good. And um, another question is, uh, is well, what, what led you to want to do research on this specific topic? What, what led you to this topic of conscription? Uh, you know, as you mentioned, my uh, PhD dissertation uh, mm -hmm. was about this second uh, revolutionary period of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, uh, and to understand that period and the uh, uh, Armenians in, uh, in, that, in that period, I uh, examined dozens of, uh, let's say, journals, etc. You know, this issue frequently and continuously uh, uh, showed up in, in newspapers, in, in debates, etc. So, uh, and as I say in the beginning of my talk, uh, when I became aware that this is a critical uh, point, this is a critical issue to understand the transformation of Ottoman state or more totally the failure of transformation of Ottoman state, I decided to elaborate on this issue in order to understand this transformation or the failure of transformation of Ottoman state from me from being uh, an empire, from being, let's say, uh, an hierarchical society to being an egalitarian society. So I think, uh, as I say, it's important to focus on military service in order to understand this, if you like, democratic, hopefully, but let's say, uh, hopefully democratic uh, transformation. That's why I decided to focus on this issue more. Good, and uh, there's a question about uh, in the period before the conscription began in 1908, and really going back, let's say, into the 19th century, what, was, uh, what were some of the arguments both for and against having Christians in the army? And was that racial or religious prohibitions involved? You know, uh, again, uh, supporters or the reasons of supporters of conscription uh, were more practical reasons. For example, they said that unless they conscripted Christians, uh, existing army, Ottoman army, uh, wouldn't, met, wouldn't meet the need of uh, the country. In other words, existing army wouldn't be able to uh, protect the borders of Ottoman Empire because the Muslims, the Muslim reservoir, a male reservoir, uh, was not adequate to recruit uh, necessary manpower. So they said that we should expand our reservoir manpower, and for this sake, we should conscript Christians, okay? So meaning that there would be more potential soldiers, okay? Uh, on the other hand, these, I mean, the camp opposing conscription, Christian conscription, uh, presented more, if you like, ideological reasons. Uh, they were always afraid of the reaction, possible reaction uh, coming from Muslim conservative circles against this project. Because, you know, yes, military service was, let's say, um, a difficult duty, but at the same time, in the eyes of these people, it was also a privilege peculiar to Muslims. Once you extend or include Christians into this duty, it means you also extend the privilege of being soldiers, okay, to these people. So uh, the camp opposing conscription usually, not only, but usually uh, contended this as a reason not to conscript, not to draft uh, Christians. And 
I mean, again, it's a long uh, issue, but on, similarly, one of the important bureaucrats of the 19th century, Cevdet Pasha, Ahmed Cevdet Pasha, for example, said that it would be uh, impossible or very difficult to motivate an army which was composed of Muslim and Christian soldiers. Because he said that he, said that he contended that uh, in the current Ottoman army, soldiers were largely motivated by religious discourse, meaning that Islamic discourse. Once you conscript Christians, obviously uh, you cannot motivate them through Islamic, uh, let's say, ideology and discourse. Then what would happen, he asked. We cannot uh, administer, we cannot uh, govern such a mixed army. So again, uh, I can multiply the examples, but roughly speaking, uh, these were the positions of two camps, two camps of bureaucracy, the Ottoman bureaucracy in 19th century. Now there's two questions that are, are, are talking about the same thing or asking about mm -hmm. the same thing. It's, it's about uh, the conscription of Armenians and non-Muslims after World War I started. So uh, did that continue to occur uh, at the beginning of World War I? And then uh, do we know how many Armenians were actually uh, conscripted? Is there, are there lists available? Uh, is that available? Uh, no, uh, the short answer, no. Uh, not only for, let's say, ordinary people, let's say, uh, served as private or conscripted as privates into the army, but uh, we do not have even list of uh, Am uh, Armenian officers, I mean, professional soldiers uh, in the Ottoman army. I mean, there must be a list somewhere in the Turkish archives, uh, but at least for now, uh, it's not available for us, let's say. We don't know even if there is such a list. And you know, of course, uh, it continued in the beginning of First World War. First uh, World War. Uh, again, although we cannot say for sure, but I think we can say that tens of thousands of Armenians, young youngsters, were conscripted in the fall of 1914 as a necessity of mobilization of war after Ottoman Empire declared or joined the war, uh, as other citizens, let's say, Armenians were also conscripted. And you know, that's why I said the, this conscription issue made it easier, the annihilation of Armenians. Because otherwise, could you imagine all these tens of thousands of Armenian young people would remain in their towns and villages. Once you collect them into the army, of course, it became easier to terminate, to annihilate them, to massacre them. This is the direct result of conscription. I mean, uh, but there's also another indirect conscription. If those people had remained in their hometown, in their villages, in their uh, towns, most probably it would have been more difficult to exile people because their uh, partition from their home, of course, will uh, left all these villages and towns more defenseless, if you like. Uh, but again, of course, this is a tragedy, let's say, this is a bitter irony for which, of course, we, are, we cannot blame anyone. So we're gonna have just two more questions. Uh, one, two. one question is about, uh, you mentioned as some of the reasons uh, for Armenians thinking about conscription as being problematic was the fear of Armenians and forced conversion to Islam. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit? Was that a common, common occurrence for the forced uh, conversions? And did that happen inside the army that actually Armenians were forced to? Uh... Uh, yeah, I mean, we know that forced conversion uh, was a common practice in let's say uh, Ottoman politics, especially in, as you know, in 1894-96 massacres, uh, Armenians massively were forced to convert 
uh, Islam and even uh, again we cannot be sure about the exact uh, exact number statistics but we know that ten, again maybe at least tens of thousands of Armenians were converted to Islam during these massacres so based on this memory let's say uh, they feared that uh, they might have been also forced to convert when they were in the army. Uh, however, uh, I didn't come across any uh, considerable, remarkable uh, recording uh, talking or stating such f for such enforcement in, in the ranks, in the army, okay? Uh, but, you know, I can maybe mention an interesting case uh, that I came across on the paper. One of the Armenian soldiers, at maybe there was more than one, but this is reflected in the press. One of the Armenian soldiers, I don't remember his name, uh, converted voluntarily because the existing conscription law, Article 56, stated that who converted to Islam would be exempted from uh, military service. Because, you know, this law was the old one when uh, Christians and Jews had not been conscripted. And, you know, that article, Article 56, indeed was there to encourage Christians and Jews uh, to convert to Islam. Because, you know, imagine that you are a Christian and you are willing to convert to Islam, but if you convert, you will be conscripted. You have to serve in the army. So they put such an article there to encourage you, or at least not, break, not to break your courage to, to convert. So uh, again, I didn't come across any remarkable any expensive uh, enforcement of conversion on Armenian soldiers in the army. But again, this was a fear was there previously or before joining the army. Great. And the final question, it's not directly related to the topic in the sense of, uh, of the mm -hmm. 1909 conscription, but it refers to uh, two different people asking about uh, the Dev Shirmeh, and then therefore, uh, at that time, uh, the Christians were forcibly conscripted into the army. And then the second part of that is, when did the Janissaries stop being a major factor in the Ottoman Empire? Uh, to give the exact date, in uh, 1826, Janissaries were eliminated from Ottoman army and from Ottoman politics and from Ottoman social life. And it was indeed a bloody event, their elimination. Uh, but you know, he, I'm talking about conscription of Christians and Jews later, who live as Christians. Okay, you know, when you say devshirme, it means those people who were collected at their youngest age, it differs from time to time, region to region, but their youngest age and converted, converted to Islam. And afterwards, they lived as a Muslim. And you know, some of them indeed, some of these Dev Shirme were indeed very, let's say, um, pious, very uh, religious Muslims. So it's a different case. Uh, so what I'm talking or my, my concern is the conscription of Christians and Jews as Christians and Jews, okay? Uh, after their conversion, the Shirmay people were not any longer uh, Christians. They were just any other Muslim. Thank you, Dr. Kilichda. We sure, appreciate sure. this uh, very interesting my pleasure. lecture into a very interesting topic about the conscription of Armenians. We look forward to your next lecture, which will be Me on too. Friday, October the 16th. And again, we invite uh, those who were here uh, tonight that we will have some upcoming events in September. On September 24th, um, we will have a lecture next week by Dr. Tamar Boyajian. And then we'll also have a lecture on Sunday the 27th and all of the interesting 
uh, lectures and presentations that are coming up. So once again, thank you, Dr. Kilichta. Thank you all My for pleasure. joining us My and pleasure. we'll see you at our next lecture. Thank you.